Hello, this is Bill Servan, Director of the Center for Advancing Teaching and Learning at the University of Wisconsin-La Crosse. This is part one of two short video presentations on motivating college student learning. These are intended to help college instructors better understand and support their students' motivation. Part one explores factors that influence students' motivation, and part two describes strategies to enhance student motivation in your classes. Lack of student motivation can be a significant problem that interferes with teaching and leads to poor student performance. Typical examples are students who seem disinterested and disengaged throughout a course, do only what will earn them points toward a course grade, withdraw from a class after a bad exam and avoid the subject in the future, come to class ill-prepared, give up easily when confronted with a difficult task, are passive participants in class discussions and exercises, are satisfied to produce mediocre work. These are typical motivation problems in college classes, but it is important to acknowledge that not all students are poorly motivated. Many care about learning, work hard, persist on difficult tasks, and bounce back from failure. Moreover, motivation is not an all or none characteristic. Students' motivation can vary in the same course. A student who appears disengaged at one time can be very much in the game at other times. Students who show little effort in one course may be highly motivated in another. What accounts for these differences? Researchers explain academic motivation in terms of four major factors. Students' academic goals, their self-efficacy, that is, their beliefs about their ability to succeed, value, that is, the value attached to their goals, and attributions, their beliefs about what causes their successes and failures. Let's start with academic goals. Academic goals are important because they organize and focus students' effort. Researchers distinguish several types of achievement goals that have different effects on student motivation. Learning or mastery goals. Students' primary goal may be to learn the subject, develop knowledge and skills, and to become competent. Students who are guided by learning goals tend to exert greater effort, persist on difficult tasks, use feedback about their performance to improve their learning, and seek out experiences that will build their competence. Performance goals. A second type of goal focuses on performance. Students with performance goals are concerned less about learning and more about looking good in achievement settings and protecting their self-image. Students' effort focuses on doing what they need in order to gain recognition, get rewards, and appear intelligent. Performance-oriented students derive satisfaction more from being seen as competent and less from actually developing competence. Work avoidance goal. Third type of goal focuses on avoiding learning. Work avoidance students do work quickly, do just enough to get by, and derive little or no satisfaction from learning. These students probably trouble us most. They seem disinterested and unwilling to learn. These goal orientations lead to different types of effort. Students with mastery goals not only try harder, they are more likely to adopt deep learning strategies to master the subject. Work avoidance students, on the other hand, are likely to use a superficial approach to skim the surface of the material. Students may have a strong predisposition toward one or another goal orientation, but the classroom conflict context can influence them significantly. For example, a student who is mastery oriented may appear work avoidant if she is overwhelmed by the quantity and complexity of work in a course. There may be no time to learn the subject deeply. Given excessive demands, she may resort to doing what needs to be done and nothing more. Another example, teachers may inadvertently undermine mastery goals by not sufficiently justifying the importance of the subject matter or not trying to cultivate interest in the topic. Or instructors may assign points to every aspect of coursework, conveying an ambiguous message about the value of the work. Are the learning activities important in and of themselves or only insofar as they count toward a course grade? Self-efficacy is a belief about whether one is capable of attaining a goal. Students with high self-efficacy believe they possess 
possess the ability. Those with low self-efficacy doubt their ability, or worse, believe they don't have the necessary ability to succeed. Efficacy is not the same thing as self-esteem or self-confidence. It's rather a kind of appraisal about one's ability in relation to a topic or subject area. One's efficacy can vary depending on the subject area and circumstance. I might believe I am capable of doing mathematics, but not capable of learning a foreign language or playing a musical instrument. Why is self-efficacy important for motivation? Well, entering college with a strong sense of one's ability to succeed makes a difference in how students approach learning in this new context. It's a strong predictor of first year college students' expectations, overall satisfaction, and performance. Students with higher self-efficacy set higher goals and exert more effort toward achievement. Students with higher self-efficacy adopt more strategic approaches to studying and persist longer. A basic sense that one has what it takes to do well is critical. Students who believe they lack the ability tend to withdraw, give up, and see no reason to try. Can teachers change students' self-efficacy? We all have heard anecdotes from students about how a certain course had an especially positive or ne negative effect on them. For example, a student says, my experience in that class convinced me that I have the ability to succeed in the subject, and now I might even minor in it. Or conversely, my experience in that class convinced me that I do not have the ability to succeed in that subject. I dropped the course and hope I can avoid taking another one in that field. In part two, we will examine some ways that teachers can orient their classes to better support students' sense that they can succeed. The importance or value of a learning goal influences students' motivation. Researchers distinguish three different sources of value or satisfaction associated with learning goals. Attainment value is the satisfaction associated with attaining competence or mastery. The source of value is related to the sense of being good at something. Intrinsic value is satisfaction associated with learning in and of itself independent of the outcome. Intrinsic motivation refers to effort and persistence students put forth simply because learning is satisfying in and of itself. And instrumental value refers to the importance of a learning goal as a means to accomplish another goal or, or receive external rewards, such as praise, recognition, status, money, career options, and so forth. Students may attach all three types of value to a single goal. They engage in learning because they enjoy the experience and want to become competent in the subject, but they may also view the instructor's praise and recognition as important. So does the type of value really matter in terms of student motivation? In some sense, it does. Motivation research shows that when people are concerned primarily with external rewards, their effort, persistence, and quality of work tend to be lower than those who are concerned more with mastery and intrinsic value. Moreover, teachers can influence students' value for learning through the types of rewards, praise, and recognition they use. As we will see in part two, different types of praise can support or undermine students' intrinsic interest in learning. Attributions are the causes we ascribe to our successes, mistakes, and failures. For example, a student who does poorly on an examination attributes his performance to lack of ability in the subject. Another student attributes her poor performance to lack of preparation for the test. Another student who does well attributes her success to the easiness of the task, of the test. Each student identifies a primary cause, a causal attribution, that accounts for his or her performance. Attributions matter because they affect future effort and persistence. Suppose after several low grades on coursework, a student attributes his poor performance to lack of ability. The student is likely to conclude that there's no point in trying harder. Why bother? I can't do it, and studying more is a waste of time. Or suppose the student concludes the reason for poor performance is lack of appropriate preparation. In this case, the student can do something to control the outcome, study more, and get additional help about how to study more effectively. Students are more likely to put forth effort and persist if they attribute their performance, good and bad, to their effort, which is an internal, controllable cause. 
This makes intuitive sense. If I believe I have done well or poorly because of my own effort, I believe that I can influence what happens to me in the future. By working harder or better, I can continue to do well or recover from doing poorly and improve my learning. If on the other hand, I attribute my performance to external causes, there's little I can do to improve my future performance. Whether I believe it was task difficulty, luck, or the quality of teaching that caused my performance, all of these are beyond my control. Why invest a lot of effort in studying or trying to improve if your performance is determined by factors unrelated to effort? To summarize, we can say that students tend to be better motivated when they work toward learning goals and developing mastery, believe that they have the ability to reach their academic goals, view learning and competence as important, and attribute their performance to the amount and quality of their own effort. In part two, we examine how teachers can use these ideas to better support effort and persistence.